everybody. I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. So, uh, we have hit the end of the Chronicles of Narnia. And this is not my favorite book in the series. This is, in fact, a book that I am, for once, violating my personal rules over. Under normal circumstances, I only do books on this channel that either A, a book that I've previously read that I liked, or B, a book off of one of the lists that I have had my father compile for me, uh, where those have to do with other things. Um, so this is not a book that I actually like very much. The problem with this book is that um, to dip very briefly into an area of minor controversy that I intend to dip right back out of again as quickly as possible, the Narnia series is, in fact, based on the idea of uh, teaching the fundamentals of the Christian belief system, more particularly the Catholic belief system, uh, through these books as a sort of a, a metaphorical structure with uh, Aslan standing in for Jesus. And the last battle is, in fact, the Book of Revelations. is sort of redone and retold in this way. Um, and without understanding that, the last half of this book becomes abruptly incoherent as a narrative. Um, and so, no, I don't really like it. Um, but... We're going to leave that alone for the moment, and I'm instead going to complain one more time, for the record, about the covers in the uh, reading copies that I had of this, because the Collier Book Edition has an Aslan who is basically green. I'm sorry, you look at that lion on the left, and they're staring through the sable doorway out into the end of the world, and the lion is practically green. And I'm sorry, but that's appalling. Also, the people huddled by the doorway in their weird primary-ish color things, not primary colors, but really unduly solid colors, is, is just, it's, it's tacky, and it's dopey. And what's with the head of the guy in blue there? I mean, what, what is with that? That's a head that is so wholly out of scale with the rest of him, and I don't even know what's going on there. And why do those trees look like trees that have been wrapped up in advance of winter instead of looking like trees? And yes, I know it's a stylized thing, but they're awful, awful stylizations. Um, also, that doesn't look so much like the end of the world, and it should probably look more end of worldy if you're going to be showing them watching the end of the world. Because while that does in fact match, I suppose, in its way, the narrative of the book, it also looks, well, silly. So let's go to the edition of this book, the Puffin Book edition, published by Penguin Books, uh, cover here. And I'll be honest with you, the uh, version that I have is actually a much brighter orange. I don't know what happened in the scan, but anyways... You look at this, and this is, first of all, the titular Last Battle, but it's also really, really marvelously evocative. It is it is frightening. It You know, you have Jewel the Unicorn goring one of the Kallermen there. You have, you know, uh, Split Up, and the reason I don't have the actual... Uh, spine of the book there is because the spine of the book is just orange. You don't actually have the boar carried over over the spine, so there's, like, no point. But you have, you know, the bear who's fighting with them and the various other animals that are fighting, and it's it's a dramatic and kind of scary-looking thing. It, it has a genuine sort of apocalyptic feel to it, which makes sense because it is the story of the end of the world. Um, interestingly, uh, we don't, we get at least some of, we get some of the perspective 
of uh, the children in the course of this book. Um, because we get Jill Pohl and uh, Eustace Scrub back for the grand finale, but instead this book really very much specifically opens with uh, King Tyrion, who is the last king of Narnia, with his best friend and brother-in-arms, Jewel the Unicorn, uh, which, for the record, is... It's a super interesting thing because I, it's one of the most interesting relationships in the whole series. And I don't mean romantic or anything skeevy. I just mean that it's a wonderful, like, beautiful cross-species close friendship. And I kind of adore it because um, it's, it's just... It's this idea of saying that you have this quadrupedal animal with a horn on his head who is best friends with a human and that they think of themselves as being brothers and they just click and they love each other, not in a romantic way, but in a brotherly way. And it's... I just adore that friendship. I think it's one of the best things in the book, actually, in the whole series. Just that there, you have these two, this man and unicorn, who are just so wonderfully close, and 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 I I'm a bit of a sucker for like deep, meaningful family and or friendship sort of relationships. It's not that, you know, I don't have my aspects of shippery that I enjoy, but there's something to be said about, you know, people who are friends that are just that close, that there's no romantic, there's no romance underlying it. It's just about the fact that these are two people who get each other perfectly without romance ever coming into it. Um, also because a man in unicorn would be kind of creepy. Um, yes, call me speciesist, I still think that would be weird. Anyways, um, and we have, of course, once again, the lovely, lovely illustrations that were done by Pauline Baines. And we have here Tyrion and Jewel coming across... Uh, some horses who have been forced to slave for the Kellermans. Now this, the opening of this book is based on the notion that this, and the book, and I'll be honest with you, the book doesn't actually start on Tyrion. The book, weirdly enough, starts on Puzzle the Donkey and his not-friend, although he thinks it's a friend, uh, monkey ape, whatever, named Shift. And Shift is just a complete scumbag who takes advantage of Puzzle constantly, and because he is, in fact, smarter than Puzzle, he's able to trick Puzzle into thinking that he that they're friends, when in point of fact, he's just hideously taking advantage of him. And Shift comes up with the idea of having Puzzle wear a lion skin because a lion was caught and skinned and the skin somehow wound up floating downstream to where they were, uh, that the idea is that Puzzle will impersonate Aslan and then they get free stuff. Or rather, Shift gets free stuff. And uh, so they start rumors that Aslan has returned and... When Tyrion and Jewel go, King Tyrion and his bestest best friend Jewel go to check this out, and they find talking horses having been enslaved by the Kellerman. It they find, well, Kellerman who are the, you know, pseudo Islamic uh, people from way down south of Narnia who have managed to infiltrate, and they're busy enslaving, uh, enslaving talking animals and forcing them all to work for them, and everybody is claiming that it's Aslan, that Aslan is making them do this. Aslan wants them to cut down trees. Aslan wants them to do this, that, and the other thing. And 
in the end, Tyrion, Tyrion and Jewel wind up being taken captive by the Kellerman, and Tyrion sort of begs Aslan and the universe to please, you know, do whatever you can, send us some more of those children that you periodically sent Narnia every couple of centuries that bail us out of trouble. And lo and behold, uh, a couple of children, Eustace Scrub and Jill Pole, show up and they do their best to help Tyrion, um, who is clearly a true believer because when two children show up at random out of nowhere, unlike Trunk and the Dwarf, unlike a great many other people who have seen children show up out of nowhere, uh, in the course of this, that his reaction is just, oh, they're children sent by Aslan. I have to assume they're going to be helpful. And, I mean, they sort of are, but at the same time, it's it remains amusing to me that it's like, yes, there's you got a couple of 12-year-olds show up out of nowhere, just kind of assume they can be helpful because, you know, they say so. And they do their best to free everybody to explain to them that it's not really Aslan, that, you know, they find Puzzle and they were going to show everybody, see, it's just a donkey dressed up in a lion skin, so it's not really Aslan. Uh, and Shift and the others manage to steal a march on them uh, by basically saying somebody's running around with a donkey dressed in a lion skin who's going to try to pretend to be Aslan. And at that point, of course, they can't prove anything because now everybody's going to say, oh, it's that donkey in a lion skin we were just warned about. Uh, we also have this interesting and evocative picture of the god Tash, who is the god of the Kalerman, uh, who goes creeping through the woods and freaking everybody out. Uh, Tash is, let's be honest, kind of a stand-in for the devil. Um... And Aslan at one point even says that, you know, people who do good in the name of Tash are people that I claim, and people who do evil in my name are people that Tash claims. Uh, because they wind up with this Kallerman who has devoted his life to, to you know, following the will of Tash and doing the right thing, and Aslan's like, yeah, you're, you're a good guy. Uh, and so, you know, I bailed you out and saved you at the end of the world because you were doing nice things. Um, this is, in its, in some ways, it's a very kindly sort of thing, but in other ways, uh, there is this uncompromising side to it. Um, because, of course, we hit the point where things get weird, where they have to stand aside and watch as the stars fall out of the sky, and those are the stars off to the side, those weird line-drawing things, because um, stars are people in Narnia. And then all of the animals come running through the door, which has blown up super big and wide, and they watch as, in effect, uh, all of the animals and people from the world and universe of Narnia get split in half, and the good ones get to go to heaven, and the bad ones get to go to we're not entirely sure because it's never made clear. Um, anyways, so uh, I'm, I'm going to avoid the Christian moralizing more because I don't want to discuss particularly controversial things. Um... I, I try to avoid discussing moralizing in general because it's it's tiresome for everybody, whether you agree or not. Um, anyways, so the thing is, though, that um, this is the part here at the end where it just gets weird because they just suddenly start running and they suddenly things are happening and it's just a series of events and suddenly this and suddenly that and then we saw a thing and it doesn't really have a story and this is the part where the book loses me and where I get aggravated because we've stopped telling a story we've stopped doing all those things, and uh, that's basically everything because I have talked all the way through to the end of my timer, so 
That's all, and I will see you all next week.